sing, I know without doubt. I know without doubt that my God is in this room. Miracles happen and mercies will be made new. And no weapon, and no weapon that comes against me will have any hold on me. Fear can't control me. My God has the victory. So I'll carry. So I'll carry your fire. Carry your flame. Carry your heart to the world. Sing that again. I'll carry your fire. Carry your flame. Carry your heart to the world knows your name. The world knows Jesus' name. tremble and flee when I hear a sing. Darkness will tremble and flee when they hear us sing. So shout out to God with our praise to the King of Kings. And no weapon, and no weapon that comes against me will have any hold on me. No fear can control me. My God has the Jesus' name. To the world knows Jesus' name. I sing, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. My faith will not stay silent. I will not be moved by what happens. My God. gratitude for what he's done for you and we're going to praise his name together I sing I cast my mind I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet Savior on that cursed tree. Let's sing his body bound. His body bound and drenched in tears. 
They laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Come, let's praise him today. Oh, praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. Let's sing that on the third. return. He shall return in rows of white. The blazing sun shall be
that that song takes us from Jesus dying on the cross and then to him being raised and then to remind us that one day he's going to come back and that we have hope not just for this life because he is a victorious God but for the next one that the pain we experience in this life is not the end there is something better ahead of us and that is something that I love and I love that we get to sing about that and we get to praise his name so this morning let's thank him for that and let's pray for those who don't know him yet there's a lot of people in the world who don't understand God's love they don't understand what it is that we believe as Christians they don't understand God's grace they don't understand the hope that we have and let's pray that God will open their eyes that they would know that Lord God, we thank you so much that you are a loving God, that you would come, that you would live on this broken earth, that you would die in our place, that you um, would do that for us to have a, so that we can have a relationship with you, Lord. And Lord, we thank you that you are a powerful God, that you didn't stay dead. Jesus didn't stay dead, that you raised, um, were raised to life again. Thank you, Jesus, that you came in our place. And Lord, we thank you that we have hope that one day we can know you and one day we will see you. One day we will praise you with all those angels that we just sang about worshipping you, Lord. We will worship you. We'll see you face to face. You'll wipe every tear from our eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or pain because you will remove it all. Thank you that we have hope. And Lord, for those that we know and those that we don't know, people who are far from you, Lord, you died for them as well. You love them as well. And Lord, we ask that you would do a mighty work in this nation, Lord, in this community, that people will be drawn to you. And Lord, that as we go out the doors and as we live our life, Lord, that you would equip us and help us to live a life that shines you so brightly in the world, that people will see your grace, people will see your kindness, people will come to know your forgiveness, Lord God, that there would be a change in this nation as people are drawn to you, Lord. And we thank you that you are powerful enough to do that. In Jesus' name. Welcome to LifeGate Church. We are passionate about seeing people live in the freedom and purpose Jesus has for our lives. We encourage you to join us on Version to explore our church-wide plan. This week's plan is a 17-day plan working through the book of Hebrews. We will be working through this plan for the next few weeks. Scan the QR code now and connect with us on Uversion. At LifeGate, we are deliberate about creating safe spaces for our church and community. One of the groups we want to keep safe are our kids. So, here are three things to keep our kids safe. One. Never be alone with a child. Always have others around. Two, be aware of kids, particularly in the car park and with hot drinks. Three, if you're concerned about a child, talk to a pastor. These are some things that will help us create safe spaces for our kids. October is just a few weeks away and we have four things that we want to tell you about for the month of October. Number one, for the October long weekend, there will be no in-person services. We encourage you to spend time with family and friends. Number two, for the men, we have a men's breakfast on Saturday the 14th of October at our Padstow campus. Bottom of the Barrel Barbecue will be open and it will be an opportunity for our men to connect. Number three, for the ladies, we have a Kingdom Women event on Saturday the 21st of October at our Padstow campus. This will be a time of connecting and focusing on what it means to live out who we are in Christ. Sign up at the Start Here desk. And finally, we have our next 12 hours of prayer on Saturday the 28th of October at our Padstow campus. There are some great events to be part of during October. Thank you for your financial giving. Your giving enables us to present the message of Jesus to our church and community. You can give by cash, direct deposit or tithely. For more information, head to the Start Here desk or the LifeGate website. Finally, thank you for joining us here at LifeGate Church today. Please help us stay connected by scanning the QR code to let us know that you're with us.
Amen, amen, amen. Well, this year, we've been talking about faithful. What does it mean to live a faithful life, a life full of faith? And my hope is not, that is not just a theme that the church does and you go, that's nice, and you don't take any notice. Or you say, oh, Pastor, thank you for that message. It was very encouraging. And then it goes out and then you do nothing with it and you totally forget about it. My hope, and we want to be a church where we get real, take action. Get real about what God's saying to me and then take action to live it out. So here's a question for you today. We're going to spend a little bit of time with you. What steps of faith have you taken this year? Now, I'm going to ask you in this message um, five questions. So you might want to take notes because there is no way you are going to be able to process these questions today in, in the time that we have. So I'm going to give you five questions today, and I want you to take them home. We're going to have communion at the end, and the Lord might highlight one of the questions for you. But I want you to take this stuff home and process it and prayerfully consider it. So my first question to you is, what steps of faith have you taken this year? Now, we spoke about, early in the year, we spoke about three, three, three types of faith. We talked about saving faith. That's where we are saved. God rescues us. We are put in right standing with God. We're in right relationship with God. We have our sin forgiven and we begin eternal life with God, right? That's saving faith. Resting faith is when life around us is chaotic and crazy. We trust God in that season. We know that things are outside of our control. And rather than getting ourselves worked up and worried and really concerned about the stuff that's outside our control, resting faith is saying, you know what, God? I'm going to give this to you because I can't. You've got it. That's resting faith. And the third type of faith is stepping faith, where we step out and do the thing that God, God wants us to do. Now, that could be action. That could be obedience. That could be sharing your faith. Or it could be dealing with some stuff inside you, some mindsets, some attitudes that need to be shifted. This is stepping faith. So again, let me come back to the question. What steps of faith have you taken this year? First question. Um, There there was a lady in our church named Judy. And as we went through Ready, Fire, Aim by Mark Varaghese at the beginning of the year, it talked about living on green. And and, uh, she went for a job in another church out at Campbelltown, and she got the job and took a massive step of faith for her, and she went and stepped into something new, step of faith. There is, a, there is a couple at our Preston's campus named Brax and Shaq, and as we've been talking about faithful, they've been praying about, God, what's, my next, what's our next step of faith for our family? And the Lord told them to go to Melbourne. Oh, so good for our church. Not, but good for them. Yeah, sending. Go. Go do the thing that God wants you to do. Go. Yes. Go do the thing that God wants you to do. So there are some examples of where people have taken steps of faith, where people have been obedient to the things that God wants them to do. But it doesn't have to be as radical as moving to Melbourne or getting a job in a church to be faithful to God. Now, God might be doing stuff in you this year. Um, I'm going to share a story about how God has done a work in me over the last few weeks that has led me to take a big step of faith. And you may not think it's big, but it's big for me. About six years ago, I was massively, um, massively hurt by some of the leaders in the movement of the church we're, we're a part of. Um, massively hurt. Um, trust broken, from my perspective, treated really, really poorly. And, I've been, and although I've forgiven them for what they've done, and now they've moved on, by the way, they're no longer part of the movement of churches that we're a part of, I decided that they're not trustworthy and I want nothing to do with them. So I isolated myself from the leadership of the movement that we're a part of, and pretty much the movement in our church, we pretty much isolated ourselves from them. Because of this... Oh, we're humming, Steve-o. Um, because, of this, because of this hurt and because of this broken trust. I was speaking to someone about it recently, and, and the person said, Nathan, you have had... I had to write it down. I had to look it up. Nathan, you have had... Where is it? Somewhere in my notes here. There it is. You have had a moral injury. What are you talking about? What's that? What's a, do you know what a moral injury is? Let me give you a definition of a moral. I had to look it up. 
Moral injury refers, I'm going to read it slowly because there's a lot of words, right? (laughs) Moral injury refers to the psychological, social, and spiritual impact of events involving betrayal or transgression of one's own deeply held moral beliefs and values occurring in high stakes situations. And as I read that, I was like, wow, that's me. How did he know? That's me. I felt that people were coming against my values. And we were treated in justice and treating people properly and fairly and believing in people and giving people a go. All these things that I value, they just went totally against that. And because of that hurt and that pain, as I said, I, I isolated myself from these people and the movement of churches that we're a part of. And then a few weeks ago, the Lord lined me up, didn't he? The Lord straightened me out. And he showed me that, yes, you were treated poorly, um, but get over it. Um, don't stay in this place of isolation and, 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 and distrust. Rather, choose to, choose to step in and, and uh, choose to trust again. And so that's what I've done. I've taken steps to rebuild, to get connected again. And I share that because that's a step of faith for me, because I don't particularly want to do that. I really don't want to. But I think that's, that, that's what the Lord wants me to do. So again, for you, what steps of faith have you taken this year? I don't want us to be a church where, where we come and we hear these messages and do nothing with them. Our values are get real. So what is God saying to me? And then take action, do something about it. And as we speak about taking steps of faith, please consider it. What does it mean for for you, for me, to be faithful, to be full of faith, to take steps of faith, and then be obedient to what God says? That is my prayer for our community. Amen? Well, today, we're going to look at a story in the scriptures, and I've entitled this message, Extreme Faith. Faith at a whole level that I've never, ever, ever considered or experienced. And we're humming again. <sighs> but before I do that, let me give you a bit of context again around Hebrews. We're in Hebrews chapter 11. And Hebrews chapter 11 is written to a bunch of believers who are from a Jewish background. These, these, these are Jews who have believed in the Messiah to be Jesus. And as a result, they are removed from their Christian community the uh, Jewish community all around the known world have rejected them and they've been treated really poorly for their faith. If you read Hebrews chapter 10, it talks about their properties being confiscated, people have been, they've missed opportunities, people have been put in prison for their faith. And the, and the writer to these, these, to these new believers, he says, continue in the faith for Jesus is better than any Jewish community that can be a part of. Jesus is better than, having him is better than any persecution that you, that, that, that you could have in your life. And he says, keep on going, Jesus is better. And then he goes back to Hebrews, and then he, talks, then he goes to Hebrews 11, and he says, look back at these heroes of the faith. People who went through hardship, people who weren't perfect, but they were people of faith. And they put their trust in God, and because of that, God celebrated them. So he says, even though life is not easy, continue your faith in God, because that pleases that pleases him. So then we hit Hebrews 11, and we've been working through it for the last nine months. And today we hit a really difficult passage. I'm going to read you the four verses, then we're going to go back to Genesis. I'm going to read you 18 verses, then I'm going to give you four things about this text. Here it is. Abraham sacrificing, he didn't do it, Isaac. That story, here it is. By faith, Abraham When God tested him, offered Isaac, his only son, as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned, get ready for this verse, this is extraordinary, that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. That is a bit extreme. We're going to look at four extremes today. So now what we're going to do is go back to Genesis. I'm going to read you 18 verses, so hang in there. 
And I'm going to give you the story. Of, this is what Genesis tells us, which Hebrews refers to. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am. He re- Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. Then he had, when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. On the third day. Any, anyone making any connections yet? He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I, I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then, super important bit, we will come back to you. God has said, I want you to go sacrifice your son. Abraham says, we will go and worship, then we will come back to you. Which relates back to Hebrews 11, where Abraham believed that God was going to, if he did sacrifice him, that God would raise him from the dead. That's extreme faith. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the, one of, as the two of them went on together... Isaac spoke up, makes sense. Isaac might have been 10, not sure how old he is, about that maybe, and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Where is the lamb? Imagine being Abraham, dad's put you, oh my goodness, don't even start. Verse 8, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering in faith, my son, Abraham says by faith. And the two of them went on together. When they, re- when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham! I can imagine he yelled, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its thorns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, Jehovah Jireh, amen. On the mountain, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Wow. I remember um, hearing this story in Sunday school. And the the, uh, Sunday school teacher made the connection between that story and Jesus. And the two servants were the two criminals and the, the carrying the woods, carrying the cross, sacrifice of the son. That's how it was taught. But as, a, as I now look at that text as an adult, I, I think to myself, what is going on there? I don't know if that's you look at it, but I go, what is... Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not questioning, did it happen? or did, I'm not questioning any of that. But I, I question, that's, that's just horrific. That, that, that's, that's just a horrific thing. Um, for Abraham to be asked that, for Abraham to consider that, now praise God, it was never God's intention to sacrifice um, Isaac. We know that. We know, we know it was never God's intention. But to be tested in that way, I think, holy dooly, what's going on there? Now for us today, it's really hard for us to understand that text. Because this is 2,000 years before Jesus. So this is 4,000 years ago, and it was a totally different time, right? Totally different time. It was a time when... People worshipped many pagan gods, and as a way of getting God's, the, the God's favour in order for that God to work in your harvest, or in your fertility, or in your whatever part of your life, you would give your God your best. And what is your best? Your firstborn. So sacrificing firstborn children at that time was normal. Now you might go, how in the hell is that normal? Well, they might look at us today and they might say, how in the hell is that normal when you were bought babies and you do same-sex marriage? 
as society has behaviours that become normalised, people go, that's just how it is. But actually it shouldn't be. So for us to understand this passage in its fullness, it's going to be very, very, very hard for us. But what we can do, we can pull out some extremes, four of them, from this text that we can apply to our lives. Is that okay? Four extremes. Number one is this, the extreme test. Extreme test. Genesis 22.1, sometime later, God tested Abraham. And then in Hebrews 11.17, by faith when God tested him. Abraham had an extreme test. God asked him to leave his, leave his family behind in Haran back in Genesis 12, and he did it. And now God was asking him to sacrifice his son. An extreme, an, an, an extreme test. And Abraham was willing, was willing to do it, which shows that the place of God in his life is higher than his own son. And because of his willingness, this is what we read in Genesis 22, the next bit, from verse 15. It says, The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you've done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. You know, as, 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 as Christians today, God also tests us. Now, is he going to test you to sacrifice your son? No. No, it's not going to happen, right? But in James 1, it says that the testing of your faith leads to perseverance and maturity. God will put you in situations or he'll allow you to go through situations so that he can form you to be the person that he wants you to be. In um, the parable of the talents, one's given five, one's given ten, one's, one's given one, and God says, what is, Jesus says to them, no, whatever the story goes, what have you done, whatever you've done with what I've given you? It's a test. And God, is test, God gives us opportunities to be tested, to see what's inside, for us to grow, and if we're faithful with what he's given us, guess what he gives us? More. So here's the second question for today. If you're taking notes, write this down. This is worth considering. You might be able to answer it now. How are you responding to the testing in your... What did I write? How are you responding in the testing of your faith? If you're in a testing situation right now, if God's testing you, he's using someone to test you, how are you responding? Are you being obedient? Are you shunning away? Are you doing your own thing? Second question for you today, how are you responding? The, third, um, the uh, second extreme, here we go. The second extreme we see in this text is we see extreme faith. We see extreme faith. How does Abraham process what God has asked him to do? Well, we see it in Hebrews 11. I'm going to read it to you one more time. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, Offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who embraced the promises was about to, to sacrifice his one and only son. What's that about? That's referring back to God's promise to um, Abraham that it's through Isaac, it's through Isaac that he's going to bring the descendants and the blessing to the world. So although he's received this promise, that doesn't line up with what God has just asked him to do. Verse 18, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Verse 19, Abraham, here it is. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. That's how, he, that's how he went with this. He had enough faith that if he sacrificed his son in obedience to God, he had the faith that God would then rise him from the dead because of the promises that he's made, that it's through Isaac that his descendants and the world's going to be blessed. That is extreme faith. Let me ask you this, question number three for you today. Extreme faith. What do you believe in God for? In business, they call it a BHAG. Anyone ever heard of a BHAG? What does it stand for? Big, hairy, audacious goal. It's dream really, really, really big. What do you believe in God for? And I'm not talking about stupid stuff like Ferraris. I'm talking about stuff that you, that's, that's in God's will. That's 
his promises in your life? What are you believing him for? Write this question down. A thing, another thing to reflect on. The third extreme we see in this text is extreme obedience. Extreme obedience. Abraham, when God asked him to leave Haran and go to the land, he did. And when he's asked to sacrifice his son, he was willing to do it. And again, it just shows that the, God's priority in his life was greater than anything he had in this world, including his family, including his kids. It's a picture of doing the thing that God asked him to do. So for you, fourth question, extreme obedience. Are you doing the thing that God has asked you to do? You know, the, the, our scripture is full of it, full of instructions for how God wants us, God wants us to live. And as you, as, as you do your personal time with Jesus and you read that Bible verse and that one pops out and God says, that's for you, do that. Have you done that? God's given you an opportunity. Have you stepped into that? God's asked you to hand that over to me. Have you handed it over to him? This is about obedience. Again, reflect on this question. Are you doing the thing that God has asked you to do? And the final thing in this passage I want to pull out to you is extreme sacrifice. Extreme sacrifice. Hebrews eleven seventeen, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Does that sound familiar? One and only son. John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Abraham was willing to sacrifice his everything for God. And God sacrificed. Abraham didn't do it. God gave the ram. God gave his everything for us. That while we were still sinners, Romans 8, 5 says that when we were God's enemies, when we were separated from God, when we were interested in God, when we deliberately rebelled against him, God loved us anyway and did the most extreme thing. The most extreme thing. He gave his one and only son to die on a cross. And when he died on that cross, he took the sin of the world upon himself. The holy God, the pure God, the blameless God takes the sin of the world, extraordinary, upon himself. And as he dies, he dies in our place. He takes our sin upon himself. He stands in the gap for us. He stands in our place. God did that for me. He did it for you, Brad. He did it for you, brother. He did it for you because he loves you and he saw you. He did it for each one of us. The extreme sacrifice. And as we look at what Christ has done for us, we are to respond. And in Romans 12, verse 1, Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, really important four words, in view, five words, in view of God's mercy, five words, in view of God's mercy. What's God's mercy? Christ's death for us, his grace, his love for me, his love for you. What Christ has done in view of that, in view of what he's done now, offer, offer, respond, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. In other words, sacrifice your lives for him. That doesn't mean kill yourself. It means lay down your agenda. Lay down your priorities for his priorities. It's saying, less of me, God, more of you. I surrender my life to live a life of obedience to you. Last question for you today. Last question. Write this one down. What do you need to sacrifice? What priority? What agenda? What attitude, what do you need to lay down? What do you need to sacrifice? 
wanting you to lay down. So as we come to the end of this message, the first question was, thanks, Aiden. What steps of faith are you taking this year? What step of faith have you taken this year? That was the first question. And then I gave you four more. Number one, how you're responding in the testing of your faith. Two, extreme faith. What do you believe in God for? Extreme obedience. Are you doing the thing that God has asked you to do? And number four, extreme sacrifice. What do you need to lay down? What do you need to sacrifice? My prayer is that this won't just be another message, but it'll be something that you take home and you reflect. And you spend time with God and say, God, speak to me about this stuff. As you open his word, may his word speak to you. As you pray, be listening for his voice. The promptings of the spirit, the peace, the unsettledness that God gives. And let's be people who are full of faith. We're going to close the service with communion. And at LifeGate, we invite people to come forward, get a biscuit, get a cup, take it back to your seats. And in your time, as you eat the bread, you're remembering Jesus' death for you, in his death in his body, and the blood reminds us the blood. The juice reminds us of his blood. He died for you so that you can have a relationship with God, that you can have forgiveness of sin, that you can have life eternal that starts now and goes forever. Relationship with him. So I'm going to pray, then I'm going to invite you forward. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. And as we look at this story of Isaac and Abraham, wow. Can't, I can't get my head around it, God, I really can't. But, we, but what we do see is the test. We see his faith. We see his obedience. And we see the sacrifice which points us to your sacrifice that you gave, the sa- Jesus, as a sacrifice for us. Help us to respond, God, with lives that are full of faith because of your sacrifice. In view of God's mercy, we may live lives for you. We thank you for Jesus' death. We thank you for his resurrection. And as we take this communion, we are proclaiming his death and his resurrection until he comes again. Amen.